the topic session is writing to 70, composing the internship experience, social media, and digital discourse. Uh, Denise Gomer is an associate professor of the practice of writing studies and director of first year writing at Duke University. Uh, her scholarship, which explores writing pedagogy, writing program administration, and intersections between technology and teaching of writing, appears in leading composition journals. Uh, Den Denise regularly integrates various technologies into her face-to-face -face courses through expansive use of Sakai and WordPress, PebblePub, Google Hangout, WordThread, Wikis, and social media. Now, let's hear from Denise herself about this course. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I first want to thank the Atlas Award Committee for um, honoring the, the course with the award. I was really grateful and delighted that it won. I'm going to spend about 30 minutes talking about the course and demonstrating some of the features that we use in the course, and then I'll have room at the end, about 15 minutes, for questions and conversation. So Writing 270, oh, this is the presentation overview. So um, I'll go through the Writing 270, Sakai tools, the integrations, learning outcomes, some of the student data challenges that we're experiencing. And I did do a video for the course um, so I'll play that for you at the beginning because I think it really kind of shows the feel of the course that we were trying to create. I'm writing a song about my life I'm getting along doing just fine Hello. My name is Denise Comer. As you may have noticed, social media are gaining increasing prevalence, not only as a way of connecting with friends or making new ones, but also as an indispensable part of professional life. People across a wide range of working contexts are finding it especially valuable to cultivate their digital identities through such platforms as LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Blogspot. One moment when it makes particular sense for people to begin reflecting on their use of social media in the professional context would be when students are participating as interns or in other work experiences during the summer. I have designed Writing 270, Composing the Internship Experience, to offer you an opportunity to reflect meaningfully on your work as an intern or in another work experience through the lens of social media. So um, the primary learning outcomes for the course involve writing, reflecting, and discussing. And so students are working during the summer as interns or employ employees. And the idea is that over eight weeks, they uh, develop a series of writing projects that enable them to reflect meaningfully on their internship experiences and to network with one another um, within the course. So the main writing projects that they create are an ongoing blog, and they also create a microblog. They develop a digital story. And then the final project is an Ask Me Anything, um, any kind of project that they want to design, and I'll show you examples of them. Along the way, some of the other learning objectives are to reflect on their internship, to discuss the role of social media, and to evaluate their own writing and others' writing um, along the way. So peer feedback is an integral part of the course. I have here the menu from Sakai that we use. Um, the I guess the primary underlying um, motivation of the course is to develop a seminar environment in a fully online course. And for Duke students, this is only one of maybe three or four undergraduate courses right now that are fully online uh, over the summer. And so it's a, um, while Duke has a robust kind of online education initiative in terms of the undergraduate population in Trinity Arts and Sciences, it's still pretty nascent and emerging. So um, we wanted to create a seminar environment to integrate work Workshop, writing workshop pedagogy where people were reading and responding to one another's drafts and where um, the seminar environment where students were creating their own knowledge rather than me delivering content to them. And that was kind of a, the, the big challenge that we had to face as we were designing the course. 
It lasts eight weeks and is comprised of um, a series of asynchronous lessons. Students have bi-weekly deadlines, so they can self-pace, but they have to complete a certain number of lessons by Thursday, 9 a.m. Eastern time every, every week, and then another set of lessons by Monday, 9 a.m. Eastern time every, other, every week. Um, it, as I said, it lasts for eight weeks. We're currently in our fourth year. We have um, three sections each summer that we're now offering with a 15-student cap. And we have an instructor and a TA for each section. And this is because there's really a lot of work that students are producing, and we wanted to have it be high touch where instructors and TAs were really responding to students and also facilitating and networking the interactions between students. And so we have a pretty good um, teacher student ratio. We primarily use Sakai, but we also use WordPress, and we rely on a lot of multimedia for the course. A little bit about the context for the course. Duke University is a liberal arts institution, and uh, internships are, um, in, I guess, gaining increasingly at Duke through various, uh, depending on people's majors. Not every student at Duke does an internship at any time. It's not required, but in certain programs and with certain majors and certificates, it is required. So um, this initiative has come, I think, out of the... Um, tension between a liberal arts education and career development and return on investment and, and how students are going to um, show their parents that their Duke education is worth it, right? That they're going to end up in a, in a job. So um, the um, we wanted to off the, the problem that, that the um, Dean Baker, then Dean of Academic Affairs, identified was that employers were increasingly requiring four credit internship experiences. So a university had to award credit for um, an unpaid intern. And what Duke students have been doing is that they would work over the summer, and then in the fall when they returned to school, they would take an independent study with a faculty member in a related discipline and kind of reflect retroactively on their internship. And this worked really well in some cases, but in, uneven in other cases. Um, either it put increased burden and pressure on um, non-regular rank faculty, who often were the people who led the independent studies and were not compensated for it. Um, or it also, just in terms of how they reflected, we were losing kind of the traction and, and uh, meaningfulness of concurrent reflection on, on their internship. And then, of course, some of these weren't really reflective at all. You know, it was it was looking at other aspects of the work experience. Um, so, the main other problem that we were facing was that internships in general were um, not equally accessible to all students. So, students who were on um, financial aid packages. Um, often needed to work over the summer in order to contribute to their um, their financial aid requirements, and so they didn't have the family resources to go ahead and spend three months in New York City at a banking internship with no, um, you know, no compensation. And in fact, they had to work. But what happened is that if we offered a four-credit concurrent internship course, then those students who are um, on financial aid, they're allowed to take. I think up to two summers worth of course credit where their financial aid transfers and adapts to the cost of living of wherever they are. And so what it did essentially is it enabled people who are on financial aid to have access to inter unpaid internships because the financial aid could support their work. So that was really important. I'm in the Thompson Writing Program, and we primarily offer face-to-face -face writing courses, mostly for first-year students for the first-year writing program. Um, but I had had experience in 2012 and 13 designing a massive open online course through Duke and Coursera. And so Dean Baker um, was facing all of these problems and complexities with internships, and then he knew I had um, experience designing online uh, writing courses, and so he said, Denise, um, do you want to design something? And I said, yes, because I was interested. So um, that's how the course came about. This is a kind of a busy slide, but I wanted to emphasize that I'm standing up here, but it's a whole team of people who have um, contributed to designing the course. I first of all want to thank the um, Duke Center for Instructional Technology people, especially those two people in the near the blue box at the top, Randy Riddle, who was my direct kind of liaison for designing Writing 270, but also Elise Mueller, who worked with me on the MOOC. And a lot of what I learned in designing writing pedagogy in a MOOC format was adapted to this course. So she didn't direct 
directly relate to Ready 270, but her influence is kind of imprinted everywhere. The other people are the um, other members of the instructional team that I've worked with over the past three or four summers who've really had a heavily heavy influence in crafting and improving the course. Um, students have given feedback and we've adapted it based on their feedback and then finally my discipline of writing studies is pretty active in thinking about online education and we have a position statement from our um, disciplinary organization um, about online writing pedagogy and um, best practices in terms of making sure that um, the online education uh, is branded on issues of access, that all students have access to the technologies that are there, that faculty teaching these courses have reasonable control over the content of their courses, that the content of the course is based on best practices in writing pedagogy, namely that writing is center stage, right? That you're looking at student writing and that you get feedback and give feedback on student writing. So. I'll start to talk a little bit about the main tools of the course. We're right now in week two of this 2017 uh, summer, so I think most of these images are from the current class. As you can see, um, lessons are the primary tool that we use, and we unveil a new set of lessons every week. We found that students would get overwhelmed if we unveiled, you know, like 80 different lessons, you know, all at once, and we really wanted to self-pace it across the eight weeks. So each week at 9 a.m. on Monday, a whole set of lessons is unveiled, and students only see those lessons. So the bottom parts of those that are in red, you saw were there to be released, I think this morning they were released. And we um, branded the lessons to look very similar to each other with um, indications of the due date of the primary learning outcomes so that students would really understand why they were being asked to do certain things and how it connected to larger learning outcomes of the course. We wanted that alignment to be pretty visible. And then because many of these students have never worked full time before and they are working often, especially in banking, 80 to 100 hours a week time management is a significant hurdle for them just in general in sleep um, but we wanted to make sure we emphasized how long the anticipated time was that each lesson could take so they could at the beginning of a given week look over all the lessons and decide okay if I know I'm going to need three hours for this lesson what are my three hours where I'm going to do it and as I said before, most of these lessons are asynchronous, and so they have until Thursday to complete certain parts of it, and then until the following Monday to complete other parts. The forums are where a lot of activity happens. Uh, we do have a few moments that are only student to instructor, but most of the time we're working in a really connectivist kind of spirit. And so all the drafts, even the final projects, all the questions, all the conversation is happening in the forums. And feedback to students, not evaluation. Evaluation happens on the gradebook because that's how it should happen. <laughs> but uh, feedback on forum posts or pushing thinking along or asking uh, probing questions, we do all that in sort of the public space of the forum. And so the instructor and the TA, so students will post about something. And then, let's see, in this case, they're posting about, this was the first week. So for this one, they had to find, they're creating a blog, and the first step in creating the blog is to craft an About Me page, and so they looked at examples of About Me pages in other blogs, in relevant blogs, and they posted um, the example that they had found and then what was compelling about it for them, and then peers commented on it you know, in relationship to the About Me pages that they had found out there. And this is all in building up to them creating their own About Me page. But so the instructor and the TA will go into that forum and ask other questions or point out something interesting so that everybody can benefit from what everybody else has seen. The idea is that students are not just only going onto the course and posting their own content, but they are required and it's um, beneficial for them to be looking at what everybody else has said which is possible because there's only 15 people in each section. If it was a larger format, we couldn't accomplish that as well. We also, these are the moments for, for private interaction between, more private, between instructor and student. We renamed the quiz tool guided reflections because we rarely in my discipline have multiple choice answers or testing of 
uh, knowledge that's pre-populated in that way, and, but we wanted a chance for students to be able to reflect in what we think might be a little more authentic than the reflections they might give on a forum where they know their peers are reading. So, of course, you still know they're writing with an audience member in mind. But one of the first guided reflections we have is about online learning. Many Duke students have not taken a college level four credit online course. <laughs> A lot have, maybe 40, 50 percent or something, but many haven't. Or it's been a long time ago, or it's when they were in high school, you know, and we're taking like early college, college prep. So we ask them to reflect on their learning styles and then to plan out each week, given their crazy, hectic, full-time working employment, when are they going to fit in the hours, you know, and are they going to be too tired? Like, are they really, is it really a good idea to do work for the class at two to four in the morning. Every morning, probably not, right? So what else can you do? So they had to come up with a schedule for when they plan to carve out enough time for the course. And throughout the weeks, we have them reflecting on uh, what the feedback process is like, and then towards the end of the eight weeks, uh, reflections about their internships and what they learned. We also make use of the wiki. We together create criteria for effective blog posts or micro blog posts or digital stories. And this happens across the course. These are from last year because this year's hasn't happened yet. And we use the grade book. Um, this has been a little bit of a source of tension because students seemed like overly um, anxious and focused on the grades. You know, we give points for even every little thing they do, we give points because we wanted to honor what they were doing. But the result of that is that it's a lot of input of like two points for posting a forum post. And then they're obsessed with these two point grades in a way that I don't think is like so productive. So that's something that I'm still kind of trying to work out. Um, but the grade book is, is helpful because they kind of know where they stand um, across the course. And then we use a variety of other tools. Um, we just recently decided to put, this seems small, but we decided to put our pictures up there next to our names. I didn't know you could do that until about the past six months, a, a colleague um, told me. And this, I think, really helps in this online format where um, we wanted to establish community and connection. Um, just even having our pictures there was helpful. We use the sign-ups in order to um, ask students. The synchronous part of the course is um, Google Hangout workshops once a week, and so they'll do a draft of a blog post or a microblog, and then we have a, a synchronous hour-long workshop with either two or three students. Sometimes I have individual one-on-one -on -one conferences over Skype or Google Hangout, and so we use sign-ups in order to accomplish that. And we also have a Start Here page because we wanted to funnel everybody's attention to one main page. So I renamed a lesson Start Here, and so they knew kind of where to go from the beginning. We have a checking in place. We have a forum for Q&A so that the instructional staff wasn't getting peppered by tons of the same questions from every single student over email. We did not want to run the course over email. We were really explicit about that because that really leads to teacher burnout. So these Google Hangouts are my favorite part of the course, and they happen once a week for six of the eight weeks. Uh, so at the end of this week, I'll be doing our first round of, of Google Hangouts. And as I said, it's where students take a draft of a project they're working on, and the instructor or TA facilitates a, a writing workshop. And so students sign up. We generally have them in ev on evenings or weekend hours to accommodate the schedules of the students. And then as you can see with the associated sites, each student creates a WordPress blog, and that's integrated with Sakai too. So there's a menu button that leads them to this 270 sites. And uh, we don't require anything to be public, but it is public within the space of the course. And part of what we talk about in the course, because it's about social media and digital discourse, is um, you know, what, what it means to be private or public, and how private and public can you be given these circumstances. The, this is a set of demographics from one summer, just so you can see who tends to take the course. This is, um, we tend to be evenly divided between uh, men and women, and um, most people tend to be um, rising seniors, so they're usually doing an internship between their junior and senior year, though we do get people who are across all other years as well. And here is a breakdown of the internship and work fields, and this is one of the best parts of the course, in my opinion, because um, 
they get to interact with students who are in drastically different fields and industries, and they get to see that not everybody's internship is nearly the same, and not every professional context is the same. And um, over the course of the eight weeks, they really do develop relationships with one another, um, either based on geographic location or just from continual interaction on the forums or the Google Hangouts. And so they, they tend to be um, a little more open and honest with each other about things they're not liking about their work context, um, like towards the end of the class than they do at the beginning of the class. But this is really a great aspect of the course. And then they've been all over. The first year I had people in China and India as well. Um, over the, I think last year and this year, it's been more domestic U.S. Um, primarily. But and some people local into Raleigh-Durham too, where our institution is located. And as I said, the final project of the course is a, a, a kind of do anything project that they create, and they've created incredible projects, uh, digital stories, TED Talks, infographics, animated sequences, websites, and um, I learn an incredible amount about all of these different industries, and we all learn together about social media within these. Primary for me, because I'm a writing instructor, though, is the um, outcomes related to writing and reflection. And this one, I think, really emphasizes the um, impact that the course can have, right? Um, where it's helping this student critically think about their work experience, about their career goals, about aligning their life values with their life practices, and all through writing, right? How can writing help you? Um, think your way into what's important to recognize. We do have some challenges. So um, workshop scheduling and student time management, as I said, like I, I, don't, I don't think I often work 80 hours a week, if ever. Maybe I've never worked 80 hours a week, so I don't really know what that's like. But they really are working 80 to 100 hours a week. Um, and taking a class that's, that's a pretty robust and demanding class. So it's, it's an issue, and we have to be pretty sensitive to that and flexible. But we don't, um, we don't, well, we might extend deadlines every once in a while. The work of the course hinges on everybody posting at the same time, right? So that then they can go back and make other comments. And so we really have to keep everybody kind of running at the same time. And so we're pretty hands-on with um, if somebody hasn't submitted like it, 9.30 a.m. and the deadline was at 9, um, the instructor or the TA will definitely ping the student and say gently, you know, hey, you really need to, to attend to this. Many organizations, as you must know, um, have confidentiality clauses and social media policies, and so um, a number of students feel like they can't take the course at all because it will violate a, a company and organization policy, and that's fair, and I don't try to convince anybody to take the course at all, so that's, that's legitimate. But the other um, offset by that is that, is that they don't, we're not requiring any posting to Twitter or any creation of blogs that is publicly accessible beyond the space of our course. Um, that said, again, we, we do recognize that once you put something out there, it can be copied, you know, and, and put somewhere else. So students who have confidentiality clauses can choose to take the course and not really reflect on anything specific or proprietary about their work. They could talk about living in um, Chicago, right? Or commuting every single day for three months and what that's like. Or um, go going out for um, drinks with colleagues afterwards and what that's like, or power dynamics, that kind of thing. So they don't have to talk about like the, um, whatever the actual work is if the organization is concerned about, about that kind of thing. We also don't supervise um, interns, and this has been hard for me because, um, well, the U.S. Fact Sheet 71 has a series of instructions and regulations about um, what's ethical in unpaid intern contexts and um, 
there are some pretty unethical practices <laughs> that happen, and there are regulations that, like, a, an, a company can't benefit from the work of the intern, for instance, right? But you know, sometimes there there are um, there are lines that I think are being pushed, but I'm not quite supervising the internship experience. And we have uh, we have a release form that students sign before they take this course, where we say explicitly, you know, I, I rec the student has to you know sign to say I recognize that I'm not, you know, this is not a supervision of your internship. Um, and so I also had um, I had a student who was interning in uh, South Korea, and she um, she felt really kind of set upon with with um, I guess inequity in her duties and responsibilities. And her dad ended up coming and intervening, which was good because I couldn't you know I couldn't really do it. But then it was difficult. I did raise the alarm, but you know she was like writing all these posts about how um, she was being. She felt she was being mistreated, so that's a challenge. Um, training our faculty um, each summer is also a challenge. I've had one person who's been the continued person, um, who's been a continued person, but other than that, the, the faculty have shifted, and the reason for that is primarily our context. I work in a um, writing program where nearly all the faculty are um, term employees and so they work for three to five years and they cycle out and so usually I wouldn't approach a newer faculty member in the writing program to teach a writing online course because it requires sort of a really vested knowledge and face-to-face -face practices first and the you know um, our program and so usually I'm tapping senior level people and then as they're senior level people they um, end up going on to their next job because that's the nature of our program. So it's been fun to prepare a new team of faculty each year, but it also takes um, some amount of work. And one thing that is tough, too, is the annual site updating. Not just the, well, the links are hard, because the links link to the prior year's forums. Like, we have links within to a quiz or a forum, and when you copy in the site, you know, it links to last year's forum, so the students couldn't access it unless you updated the links. But also, we have dates so many different places, because we wanted to avoid students being confused and saying, when is this due? What's going on? That we have to, it's a very rigorous kind of detailed process process to go through the dates. I do find, though, that it helps with that faculty preparation. It, um, the nature of going in and making those small adjustments really does acquaint new faculty with the course itself. And so it, it can be tedious, but it's helpful. And then I adapted this from Malcolm Brown's talk today when he had the little kitten with the hand raised. So um, I put these in anyway. So I think that's that's all. I just wanted to open it up for conversation, questions, comments. I'm happy to share anything. Yeah. Oh, wait one second until they bring the mic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. We uh, do uh, internship courses at NYU, and we have a lot of the same kinds of issues and challenges and successes uh, around them. Uh, we can't even call them internship seminars because of the way New York State law is shaped. That might imply that we're in league with the employer in some yes. way, and we can't be. So we call them field work classes. But uh, I was curious how you negotiate the issue of focusing on students' social media presence when you can't actually have them out there on social media due to, to, to FERPA and, uh, and other sorts of considerations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of the course hinges on them analyzing others' social media presence, and so they do some pretty thick analysis using theory of um, of people's actual social media texts. And so they'll find, like for instance, they just selected a, a microblog that they're going to follow, and so they'll find a relevant microblog for their industry, and they're going to follow it, and they're going to analyze it. And then for their own social media, we do have part of the courses where students are, so I already said about the feedback for the drafts, right? But then another part of the course is about commenting and making comments, and we do try to simulate that kind of interactive commenting environment, but it's not um, nearly what they would learn if they were actually out there in the world doing it. We have several articles. Harvard just um, rescinded, um, acceptances to 10 students for um, for um, 
an ethical meme development, and we have a series of articles about, it's, it's our, a lesson called Getting in Trouble on Twitter, and so there are a bunch of articles about how you can get yourself in trouble and fired, you know, from various professional contexts or lose opportunities based on that. So we address it, um, but in terms of their own actual experience of being out there in the world, it's a protected environment, and we do that kind of deliberately, I guess, because they're, they're still pretty... They, they need to analyze and learn before they put themselves at risk for, for that kind of exposure. Yeah, yeah. And so it's even just recently in the first week in one of the other sections, an instructor contacted me because one of the students, we have a Get Acquainted forum, and the student was making a joke about walls and uh, borders and Trump and Mexico, but it, it was like a... It was not the best joke, and it might have been interpreted as offensive to certain people, you know, and so even right away from the beginning of the course, we're talking about the use of humor and, and um, what, what, what impact it might have on different people and their impressions. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much. I, um, again, I'm honored to have received the award, and it's been a really fun experience to develop the course. So it's, thanks for giving me the opportunity to share it.